You're listening to another episode of On Our Best Behavior, and today I have two very special guests with me today. Um, they have organized the Merry Moon Foundation. It is a nonprofit organization based in Apple Valley, Minnesota, and it was founded in the memory of Mary Jacqueline O'Keefe, and her nickname was Moon. Mary loved participating in arts and crafts and a variety of games and other activities while she spent a large portion of her life. Hang on. Um, technology is great when it, when it works, right? A large portion of her final years in the hospital fighting neuroblastoma. So their mission is to conduct fundraising events, to help finance art supplies, toys and games for critically ill children and their families by providing hospitals and children hospice resources, and to help children enjoy life as much as every child should. So Christine and Peter, I'm going to let you kind of take off from there. Tell us what brings us to this point in your life, how you got here, a little bit about yourself and what I missed. Well, um... Before our daughter was born, I was very sick with her. And so Mary was born on March 4th, hence why we do the Mary Moon um, charity event every March since that's her birthday month. But leading up to her birth, I was very sick. All nine months I had hyperemesis, had to have a PIC line, which is IV line for me to receive my nutrients. I was just that sick. And... I was that way with how far my kids, but anywho, but Mary, I was the sickest with. And so when she was born, she was born with a diaphoramic hernia, which her, it was a right-sided, which is one in 100,000 verse. Then um, I noticed she was having a hard time breathing and they did an x-ray and her liver and intestines were in her chest. So she was born at Ridges in Burnsville. And then she had to be shipped off, um, four hours after she was born down to um, the University of Minnesota where they, um, at 72 hours of age, she had surgery. That went great. But before she was born, I had a premonition something was gonna be wrong with her. And I thought, oh, that's it. Um, then around age two, Mary started getting very sick. And we thought it was daycare, you know, we call it the Petri dish. And so we took her out for a little bit thinking that's, that, that will help her. And I kept bringing her to the doctor for six months and I've just had this feeling something majorly wrong. Didn't know it was cancer because childhood cancer is very rare. And the doctor kept going, oh, is this Mary's mother again? They knew mm -hmm. by my voice. I called that much because she was always sick. And... They finally, after six months, they did an x-ray and they thought her diaphragm or hernia came back. But you could see on the x-ray, the edge of the um, grapefruit-sized tumor that was on her left adrenal gland. Mary kept getting sicker, but when you're two years old, you can't tell you what's going on. So she kept asking for us to put Band-Aids on her hmm. because they had metastasized to her bone. So... Leading up to um, the diagnosis, um, I got a call from my husband going, Mary's really sick. We can't control our temperatures. And she was just, and then she got one of the classic signs of neuroblastoma where she had, it's called the raccoon sign. Because a lot of times the tumor will go um, behind the optic nerve. And so it just looks like she, she had two black eyes. And she was losing a lot of weight. And I got a call. I just got done with doing a surgical procedure at the hospital since uh, I'm a labor and delivery nurse. And my patient heard me on the phone with my husband because I got a call and she could hear his franticness going, I don't know what to do. Mary's really sick. And I got off the phone and my patient looked at me. She goes, you need to go home to your daughter. She yeah. didn't know what was happening, but she overheard that. And I called my husband. I said, we're going down to the university. Um, I, I'm not getting answers. I'm getting virus, virus, virus. Oh, Christine, you're okay. And they started treating me like Munchausen by proxy. Before we got to the university. Yeah. So I picked her up, brought her down there. And finally, this wonderful doctor, now he's like high up now, Abe Jacob, listened to me. And they did an ultrasound. And when we were in the ultrasound, I saw the look on her face and she got very quiet. The tech put 
she couldn't tell us anything. And then they're like, oh, wait, wait it, it, it could be just a cyst. And they sent us home. They're like, send you home. I had my dad coming in and people from all over the United States, my family members, because I was hosting a week-long party for my dad's 70th birthday. And I went to Ridges, got a CT scan, came back. The last person from my family comes in, and I got the call from Dr. Jacob saying, Mary has neuroblastoma. We do have to do a biopsy and um, make sure, but we're pretty certain it is, and she needs to come down to the university right now. You can't wait. And so the great thing is all my family members came in. I already did all the work. They took over for my dad's 70th birthday party. And that's where our journey began. But the grueling, it was one year from the day she got diagnosed was July 30th, 2008. And she died July 30th, 2009. Mm. So she was always sick, but she never complained. She, she was Kids are just so strong. And so it was heartbreaking. And as a mother, I beat myself up going, if I would have just pushed harder six months prior, because I was getting calls all the time at work, Mary's sick, you need to pick her up, you know, from, you know, the daycare center and just, she would kind of get better and she just was getting skinnier and skinnier. And then we noticed too, before the diagnosis that her um, rib cage was kind of protruding forward, protruding outward because the tumor was pushing out her chest. Oh goodness. Yeah. So the doctor said that they think that the reason why her primary pediatrician thought it was just, she thought it was the diaphragmic hernia coming back that they had switched the, um, the x-ray maybe it was reversed, but they said they would call me back the next day and they never called me back. And I just think as a mother, would she still be here if I would have pushed harder? And neuroblastoma is the most aggressive of the childhood cancers. Yeah. And it's rare. When, you're pre when you were pregnant, did they notice anything with her development along that, along the way, other than you didn't feel well? Nope. And mm -hmm. I actually at 12 weeks went, I don't know if I can do this anymore because it was 24-7 a vomiting. It, it wasn't just like my other pregnancies, I would I was sick, but this one brought me to my knees. And I remember the doctor at 12 weeks bringing the Doppler so I could hear Mary's heartbeat. And I'm like, all right, I can do this. Because <laughs> I, I just want, I'm not going to have any teeth. I'm like an unwilling bulimic, I was thinking. Right. <laughs> so yeah, but they did not see anything. And they think the diaphragmic hernia happened after the 20 weeks. And okay. they don't think the neuroblastoma had anything to do with the um, diaphragmic hernia. But I wonder with all the medications I was on to help me with my hyperemesis, mm. that caused cancer, you know, the, the mm -hmm. mother's guilt, all those goals through my head. So. so so, the surgery that she had right after birth was to fix that hernia? Yeah, she just. Okay. Oh, she did well. There, yeah. Because. If it was on the left side, they go on a thing called ECMO. It's basically, there is a machine that's doing all the work for you, breathing, circulation, and they're critically ill. And they said at that point, she had a 30 to 40% chance of passing away from the diaphragmic hernia. So Jeez. that's when I found out right after she was born. <laughs> it oh was my just goodness. a whirlwind from day one. Yeah. And then tell me, you guys have another organization or program called Crescent Cove. Tell me about that. So we um, give our um, proceeds to two organizations. Um, so first, obviously, uh, uh, University of Minnesota Masonic Children's Hospital to what is called Child Family Life, which gives kids activities while they're hospitalized. They help out the siblings and the parents. So they, I think, were just as important as the medical treatment. Now, Crescent Cole, after Mary had passed, I kept getting people coming up to me going, hey, they're trying to start this, um, uh, the first hospice program for, for pediatrics. Yeah. And there was only two in the United States at that time, one oh. in California and one in Arizona. 
And they were under an, another name prior to that. And so they had changed it to Crescent Cove. And about, what would you say, about six, seven years into our charity that we decided to start giving to them too. And so now we, those are our two um, organizations that we give all of our proceeds to. And I just believe that Mary brought me to them to help them. And then the lead person, the founder, Katie, um, just said that she was, you know, interviewing people for a job and both their names are Mary. And I go, hey, Mary's, Mary, Mary's pulling some strings from up above. <laughs> So yeah, so we give to them. Um, I wish Mary would have had hospice. And so when Mary passed away, here we were walking down the hall of the oncology medical floor and kids are running around and I'm I'm going home empty handed. It was just heartbreaking. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And you know what? I now know it is I've always thought people would just say that losing a child is the worst thing. I'm like, oh, they're just saying that. I can verify it now. Both my parents yeah. have passed. My mom passed um, back in September. And the two together don't even hold a candle to losing my daughter. Because I think the mother in you are like, gosh, why couldn't I protect her? I'm a nurse. I should have been able to protect her. And obviously that shows me that I have no control. <laughs> Yeah. Right. And I think like we go our whole life thinking, you know, we, we have this, um, this silver lining of life with this American dream. We're going to, we're going to go to college and we're going to get a job and we're going to get married and we're going to have babies and everything's going to be great. And we're going to live happily ever after. And when that doesn't happen, that's the unimaginable. Like no one is prepared for that. I, I do think that's every parent's worst nightmare. Yeah. And one of my friends just lost her child to cancer. And I've been checking on her every week because I told her, I said, this is what happens after the dust settles a few weeks after the funeral, everybody goes away. I get it. They're busy. But you're, you just, it, it changes everything in your life. It, and I'm glad the moment she passed, something in me said, get out of bed because if you don't get out of bed, you'll never get out of bed. So every day I had a purpose, got out. And I still do that. Why me, God? Because I exercise, I eat well, you know, rarely drink, never did drugs, just did everything right. Only thing is with all my pregnancies, I get hyperemesis. So I'm trying to pinpoint why she got sick or was it just She's here to teach me something. And maybe that's the reason why I'm supposed to do the Mary Moon Foundation is she came here to open my eyes or our eyes. <laughs> this is so, the there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love the kitty. <laughs> um, so what did your life? So Mary passes. Now, what does life look like for the O'Keefe family for a little bit? It was dark. Um, I don't know if you want to say stuff because I'm, I'm using all the other time. Do you want to say anything? You know? You're a great speaker, Christine, so you may speak, but. Uh, yeah, you should add something too. Your yeah, so, so when Mary passed, you know, uh, we did a we did a quick walk. Um, what was the walk for? We raised money for. Neuroblastoma. We ra raised some money after uh, Mary passed away just to, just with a month, within a month or a few weeks. Even. Three weeks later. And we uh, raised some money for neuroblastoma and we also mm -hmm. wanted to have more kids. Um, so, uh, cause it was really interesting for our older son, Will, uh, who was three years older than Mary. So he was about six or so at the time, you know, he, um, he became an only child, right? You know, he, he was an only child and Mary was mm -hmm. born and then, and then he became an only child again, you know? And so we didn't want him mm -hmm. to be an only child and, and we were getting, you know, I was, I was, I wasn't a spring chicken anymore. Nor, nor, um, Christine might have been, but uh, we asked the doctor to help with our pregnancy to have more kids. And when you do that, um, ask the doctor for help. Sometimes you end up with more than one. So about a about a year later, um, August fourteenth, uh, John and Katie were born, and uh, that really kind of breathed a lot of life and positivity back into our home, mm -hmm. um, especially with Will, our older our older. Um, uh, son who's now 21 and in college and all that but uh he uh that was just a great great thing bringing john and katie home we got these great 
pictures of uh, Will in the hospital holding his new brother and sister with a big smile on his face. Um, and then, and then we really felt that uh, something happened to us that we wanted to give back to the community. Uh, our experiences, uh, we were, when we were in that hospital for a year with Mary, we were very well supported by our, our employers and by our community of friends and family. Uh, but we also realized that a lot of children were there with parents that weren't as well supported uh -uh. As, as we were. And it was really, it was really heartbreaking to see, um, I can only imagine being a parent, having your child hospitalized and not having that level of support. Yeah. So Christine started bringing things in and then you can bridge off of this conversation, Christine. She started sure. bringing things in to the University of Minnesota Children's Hospital, um, toys, because we, there was a room with toys and it was great to rotate the toys, but some of the toys were worn. Um, and you can imagine Mary's longest stretch in the hospital was nine weeks. 63 days straight in a room, maybe as big as a bedroom. This uh, room. Yeah, 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 this room. <laughs> and it was really confined and she couldn't leave because of her immune system and things like that. So we were rotating toys in and out. And so when, when Mary passed, we wanted to give back to help replenish those toys. And so uh, Christine, help me out here now. You were bringing things in and you met, yeah. you met Jen, right? Well, Jen found out about me. So her name is Jen Foss, the University of Minnesota. And she, so I'll back up why I started doing this. So um, one of the things uh, prior to Mary's diagnosis and as a two-year-old in a hospital setting, she was freaking out. So Child Family Life came in gently and they started blowing bubbles. That's all. And Mary just calmed down. So they would come in the room. Hey, we got an activity. And they'd have an activity room. Or they'd come in with different things. And we would do arts and crafts. And each time Mary was in for her hospital stay, I would design a room. I'm like, all right, let's make it. Okay, it's Halloween. We'll do this. I remember taking stuff and making a chandelier. And, and then creating just a whole different thing just to change it up and do stuff. And while Mary was on the bone marrow transplant unit for nine weeks, I joked that I was Mary Poppins because I'd bring in my big bag and we'd change out the toys that we brought from home. But we had to clean everything up because, um, so think of a bone marrow as chemo on steroids. Yeah. Your bone marrow will not regenerate unless you get the bone marrow um, transplant. So Mary, it was her own um, bone marrow. But the thing is, she got some virus and it was eating it. So she usually they're there just a few weeks. And Mary, it just kept rejecting it. And she just, this virus that was killing her. And then she got C. diff, which was really wonderful. <laughs> Poor thing. thing. Before um, they got done with the Masonic hospitals, they were building it. That meant we could be in our own room afterwards when she had regular chemo because otherwise you were stuck in a room with another child crying all night yeah. so you're not sleeping because ivs are beeping and me as a nurse i'd go in there and help them out i'm like okay blood okay let's switch it over this and then i do their input output and write everything down for them because i know us nurses are short-handed so yes. but also it gave me a purpose but so mary passes and every few months i'd bring stuff down to them so the kids could have activities, toys, arts and crafts, you name it. And they kept coming up to me, asking me, do you want, do you want to start a charity? I'm like, I'm a nurse. I, I'm just paying it forward. I don't want any recognition. And then I got pregnant with the twins. And about a year afterwards, they came up to me again. I'm like, okay, got it. This is what you want me to do. I will do it. And then we had a first before it, it's now Great Wolf, but it was called Water Park of America. Yeah, yeah. And just wild, wild people. And it just was huge. And so, oh, and I, I had jumping around. So Jen Foss was the person, she was brand new to the job. She was the one that met with me and she just kept going, are you sure? I'm like, so she saw something in me that I didn't see because I was just like, I'm all good. I'll just do this out for me. I'm not going to bother people, but I'm not very good at asking people for stuff. Right. But with this charity. That's what I do. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> but, but, so you guys yeah. are a good team. Yeah. But I'm good with going out there to businesses because it's not for me. It's mm -hmm. for kids. 
Now, yeah. asking for myself, you know, us nurses, we, 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 no, I'm good. But no, it was, and it was very receptive of the people going, okay, I'll give you this. And it just kept growing and different people coming in. And it's just been an amazing ride. You know, I think we should do a shout out to our friends, Brian and Missy, who were there in the beginning too. Yeah. They helped us look into the 501c uh, federal government program to become an authorized charity uh, at that time, right? So the, our first couple of uh, activities that we weren't a 501c3 and then we said let's take that leap and um, we had to do some research and learning right on, on the, the 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 federal government guidance on how you become that right and, and in doing so it opens the door for more entities to donate to you because for for them it becomes a tax write-off as well right. so you know making that bridge in 2011 um, over to, to becoming a 501c3 really helped us and uh, we've created a great uh, group of uh, board members with uh, Alicia and Jackie and Pamela that help us in all sorts of different ways. Everybody has different strengths around marketing, social media, uh, technology to help manage the website, uh, the taxes that you got to do every year. So, you know, yeah. a lot of the things for that a charity has, there's lots of things that have to happen behind the scenes to make it go. Um, and then that allows us this time each year to go out and Look for donations from organizations, from from individual people, from from businesses, and we take all sorts of donations uh, for our auction. Um, you know, it's it, we we the first we, this is our twelfth or thirteenth year now, uh, but for the last two or three years we paused on our silent auction that we've had. Uh, COVID kind of prevented us one year, and then the economic downturn. It, it, we felt really kind mm -hmm. of improper asking businesses and. In a, in a tough economy to donate, but we're going to bring back our auction this year on a little bit smaller scale than we've had, uh, and we're going to build from there. So um, we really appreciate, you know, uh, different organizations donate a product, and gift cards are always so flexible and easy to, um, you know, put out there again, especially if you buy from that customer already, that, that, right. that, that, that vendor already, um, it, they, they go over well. And now that you've been established doing this for a significant amount of time, I'm sure that you have your regulars that are like, hey, we want to donate to this every year. Or I'm sure that there's people who have found you because they have a similar story to yours. And so then you know, they have that you know, connection with you. And mm -hmm. Very much yeah. so, really. Um, you know, when we take a look at uh, the people who have been with us for about 12, 13 years, is some of them have been with us the whole time. Mm -hmm. uh, and some people rotate out, you know, uh, you know, uh, I'm not, you know, we got other things going on this year, Peter and Christine, we're not able to help maybe in a couple more years. If we have people move out of the, the, out of Minnesota and, you know, et cetera. But, uh, uh, we always find new people, fresh people to volunteer, uh, help us run is set up on Friday night, March 15th. And then we have to be there at 7 a.m. Uh, Saturday morning to get ready, set up the registration. We have some neighbors, uh, Renee, who ships out the tickets that people buy online if they don't want to come and get a will call. Um, you know, so we have a whole variety of folks. Uh, Carol goes out to her regular list every mm -hmm. year and she she grabs and brings over to her house here, um, uh, you know, a set, set of donations and gift cards. And so uh, it is, yeah, we definitely have the regulars, but we also are always recruiting net new because some people do get busy with other things too. Absolutely. Uh, so so oh, were you going to say something, Christine? No, and I was going to say, it, it is a lot of work and keeping it going. I started doing fairs and making stuff to, and it's another way of, okay, here's what I made. Here's my story. And then you get more people and it opens it up. And we love, I think the best part is like, I hope they bring you back someday. They've done the turtle derby down at the university of Minnesota oh, yeah. and we bring stuff out for the kids and they just the smiles on their faces. And the one thing that happens every time is there's a mother that comes up to me and they said they usually don't see this with other people that um, volunteer that the parents come up to you and talk and said, well, I got two things. I lost a child. I've had a child at this place and I'm a nurse. So it's good to connect with them, give them encouragement, show them, you know, look at me, I'm surviving. But the smiles on their faces between going there or going up to Crescent Cold, like they have their, um, it, it it's it's Christmas. I'll just say it. it. They have Santa Claus and Buddy the Elf there, and so they drive around all the kids at, that are either terminally ill or have chronic illnesses, and you're giving it all. And the, just the glee, like 
they get to be a child. Yes. That is what's worth it. And they so get that's to why I forget that off. they're sick. Yeah. 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 So how do you specifically tailor your programs to meet the unique needs of the the children in the hospital? Because I'm assuming that, you know, some kids are super, super sick and some kids don't seem as sick or some kids are more limited than others. So how do you adapt? Um, you, you know, Kelly, great, great question. You know, so our, 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 our foundation runs about four events a year. And Christine was talking about the Turtle, Turtle Derby. There's other arts and craft shows that we do that allow us to get exposure to the community. Our big events coming up on March 16th, which we can talk a little bit more about in detail here shortly. Um, uh, but really how we contribute to both of uh, uh, the University of Minnesota Children's Hospital and Crescent Cove is through our ability to raise financial uh, support for them. And we provide, uh, the, at the University of Minnesota, we have an endowment fund set up. So most, not all, uh, most of our contributions to them is financial. And what it does is grows that endowment fund and that endowment fund the, the gets bigger every year and then they spend the interest off of it okay. uh, to buy the supplies and resources that they need. So we've given them permission to, you know, use the the interest off of that to for wherever they need, you know, with the theme of the arts and crafts and the toys and the entertainment that that the theme of Mary Moon Foundation was was uh, founded with. Um, the great news about endowment is it it, uh, it lives forever. You know, so we're, we'll be gone some days, but they'll still have the Mary Moon Endowment Fund there, you know, generating uh, interest that they, they can continue to spend. If you go down to the University of Minnesota Children's Hospital, you'll see the Mary Moon Foundation, a plaque as one of their, uh, you know, contributors to their, to their services. Crescent Cove, um, uh, it's very similar, financial. You know, we do bring uh, a couple other ancillary uh, support items, toys and gifts and things like that to both of both of them, but we really want to stay focused on uh, funding, right? So the Crescent Cove is, uh, is is dependent upon funding to hire nurses, hire the support, remodel the building, expand their services, etc. Um, so to just just this past uh, this is past month, uh, we 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 split uh, $50,000 between the two that we, the Mary Moon Foundation here, raised over the past 18 months um, and, and provided them that financial support in that way. How do you collaborate with the hospital, the, the medical staff to ensure the well be, the, to ensure the well-being of the children that you're serving? So you guys aren't there all the time, but what gives you good faith that you're working with good people and the right things are happening? Um, so with child family life, that's, that's what they went to school for. To, they know what the kids need. So I watched them through Mary's treatment and went, they've got this. And so I told them, I said, I trust you. You have this. And and they're all sending thank yous. And I, I just, I, they know more than me. And just watching them throwing like theme parties and other stuff and how they were so supportive, even to the day that Mary died, they did stuff with us, including my son. I just, I, I have a hundred percent trust in them because they're always reaching out going, Hey, we got this. Want to do this? You want to volunteer? And yeah. I think they're the best at knowing Both where them, to use right? it. We, yeah. you know, we've, over the years, we bump into nurses that help with Mary at the hospital. And we've gone to the Crescent Cove uh, fundraiser gala event at the end of January multiple times. Uh, and then every Christmas, every de early December, Christine and uh, Jack, you know, the board member, they typically do. And Sue, Sue joined you too this year. Oh, she loved yeah. it. You yeah. know, we, we did, they do a drive through of the families that are there. Um, and we hand out we hand out uh, Christmas trees this year. Last year we handed out uh, holiday lanterns, um, and so we have different things and that, toys too and toys uh, mm -hmm. that were donated and things like that. So we through these other activities we engage with the staff at Crescent Cove. Um, uh, it's just it's just a wonderful group of folks. Yeah, and also too um, during our gala, I'll make these big packets of stuff for them to bring to their organization. Um, one year it was the kids could paint um, birdhouses. So my son and I, we were priming all of them and got all the paints and everything. Another one was pots. So every year we try to do this whole set so the kids have it and then they can enjoy it. And I know Chris and Cole sent us pictures 
when they used the birdhouses and it was for their Easter and um, mm. get together and oh. all the kids were painting and you just saw them having a great old time. I'm like, all right, we're making a difference. Yeah. And we're okay. 100 percent volunteer based. So nobody. Right. Gets yeah. yeah. So my that leads into my next question, which is what role do volunteers play in your foundation and how can somebody get involved to be a volunteer? Yeah, so our, our, what, a lot of this information is on our website, marymoonfoundation.org. Um, my email address is there, and I, I'll help organize and structure that with Pamela, one of our board members as well. But we're looking for volunteers throughout the year for different types of contributions. Um, some people don't have time. They have product, <laughs> like birdhouses or pots, right? You know, or uh, one year we had pillowcases, I think. Um, yeah. People crochet items for us, you know, that that are, are ch children centric. But reach out to me. Um, on, uh, my my email address is on the website. Um, so donations are always great. Volunteers are good. Are, are always welcome. Uh, we're looking for a few more for March 16th. Uh, we have a, uh, a couple we need for Friday night, the, the 15th, as we set up down at the uh, Parkview Conference Center. It's right next to Fly of America there in, inside Nickelodeon University at the mall. And, uh, and then the 16th, we typically need a couple people helping put out signs, standing up balloons. And, uh, you know, then we have people that we, we have bead making, face painting. Uh, so there are some financial transactions and some directional type of support that we need volunteers to help provide uh, our guests. Um, so reaching out to me is, is great. Um, right now we could we can help need always people resharing our Facebook page, um, resharing our website, you know, promoting the event. You know, we the we have a lot of tickets we sold already. We've actually already sold 800 tickets for that event, which we're actually ahead of pace than over last year's. But they'll give us unlimited amount of tickets. Um, and the key thing that we love our guests to know is we. We have exclusive access to Nickelodeon Universe on March 16th from 8 a.m. to 10. And our guests have learned to be there by 7.30, 7.45. Get there early. Get your wristbands all set up because 800 people is very insignificant quantity compared to the volume of people Nickelodeon Universe can hold. And so there are no lines. We have people going on the roller coasters, you know, over and over and over again, just running around, getting back in line, getting back on the roller coaster, you know, so it's really fun. And so we love to sell another 800 tickets. So promoting the event, just word of mouth, right, is a great way to support our organization. Um, and then then those donations, you know, everybody, if they just pause for a moment, I think they know somebody, uh, the favorite store, uh, they know the owner or their friend owns a company. You know, what What can they do to, to donate? And we do have a couple raffle sponsorships available as well. So all that information is on our website and it directs them back to my email, my Outlook email address. Yeah, so I just kind of want to focus on the Merry Moon event at the Mall of America, Nickelodeon Universe, which is coming up, you said, on March 16th. I have been there numerous times with my family and it is the best experience for the kids because like you said it's two hours where the park is closed unless you have the special wristband correct me if i'm wrong You're and right. the kids ride on every single ride they want to multiple times and in two hours you can do the entire park repeatedly but if you go there on a regular day you're going to wait in line for an hour to go on one ride so this is an amazing opportunity and experience for the kids we always go have lunch after bum around the mall a little bit you guys in the past have had like the room with the silent auction items we always look around there there's a bunch of stuff going on it is awesome it you is know, it is it is it is like going there for free it is a really good deal if i could add you know the yeah. to make sure we're clear the wristbands are good the whole day Right. That right. first two hours is only for the Merry Moon guests. And then and then what happens is right around uh, uh, 10 o'clock when it opens up for everybody else, our, our guests will then come up to the conference room. That's where they engage in the jewelry making, the face painting, the auction, whatever else uh, activities we have up there. Um, but but then they hang out. A lot of them hang out well into the afternoon. And uh, but get there early at eight o'clock because it's a blast. Yeah, yeah, you want to be there right away. Yeah. Until eight o'clock at night. I'm like, <laughs> 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 hmm. 
yeah i know it but yeah it's fun i usually have my son i'm like bring a friend like this is and his friends are always like this is the coolest thing i've ever done like i've never been at in nickelodeon universe and been able to ride this many rides so it's good for the kids yeah you know one of the things too went so how we chose to go from the water park of america to um nickelodeon, the, nickelodeon is one of will's friends he's gonna be an entrepreneur someday Here's this 11 year old child going, I think you should go there. The lines are too long now with Mary Moon at the water park or now Great Wolf. And, but so we moved over there, got, well, why not? And Mary's last outing was at the Mall of America. Oh, yeah. She wanted to keep riding on the, the, the Paul Bunyan ride there, uh, the log ride. And, and, but she was so sick because, um, she had about a month left. No, she she died twelve twelve days later, so she she got to at least do that and experience that. And so my friend and I went to the Mall of America when there used to be a glamour shot. So Mary and I did that. <laughs> but I knew something was wrong with her. But she, I every time we go there, I'm like, this was her last place that she went to, other than the hospital. So it, it has a great meaning to us. Yeah, I love that. I love when stuff lines up like that. Oh, totally. Not a coincidence. No, <laughs> no. And it's so great to see the kids get so excited, like when the Vikings cheerleaders come or the characters. Oh, come. the Vikings cheerleaders are coming, right? Yep. yep. We have cheerleaders coming. Ooh, we pictures. Have characters there in the past that for for photo opportunities. Uh, we haven't announced well, who's going to be there this year yet. So we're still working on those final details. We we leave a couple surprises until up to the uh, about a week or two before the event. So looking towards the future, what are your goals and aspirations for the foundation? Well, I think a lot of that is regulated by our own capacity. Um, you know, we have kids that are teenagers. Uh, you know, we're we're still working full time. Uh, so we have responsibilities to our own family and we have our other, we have other hobbies and things that we like to do as well. So. Um, a lot of the growth of the, uh, or sustainability of the foundation is built around volunteers. You know, we have fantastic board members that help us throughout the year on key things, leveraging their backgrounds and specializations that they bring mm -hmm. to our organization, which is very critical. Um, I hope to sustain it. I think Christine wants to grow it. I would like to, first, first of all, sustain it, at least until I get retired. Um, I, I work 50 some hours a week already. So, mm -hmm. um, and so is, so is Christine when, but she had a migraine this week. So this was an exception. Yeah. Because well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When your vision goes out of your eye, you can't. Uh, no, <laughs> no. We've had no discussion around changing, uh, you know, who we want to help support. You know, we, we can, we will always support the University of Minnesota Children's Hospital. That's where Mary went. Hospital uh, Children's Hospice is well under understood, um, and, and it's something that people just don't like to talk about. They don't want to talk about children's. We talk about hospice for our 85 year old fathers, right? That makes sense to us, um, but but not for a three year old child or for a 17 year old uh, young boy that that has leukemia or something that's going to take his life. Um, hospice is for is end of life care. You know, it is it is for, you know, it's for the children that um, we want to give the most to, you know. Uh, another sad story was the um, Make-A-Wish Foundation. You know, we, we applied for Make-A-Wish for, for Mary, um, and mm -hmm. they called us after she died. Um, mm -hmm. They were going to grant her some a wish, right? And so we want to get active and provide those wishes, even in small doses, um, early on to, to Crescent Cove. I don't think we'll ever change, but you never know. I think we're going to continue to help fund their, their support. Uh, Crescent Cove is full. Uh, from my, I think we heard from Katie, all the rooms are full. Um, I don't know if there's a fourth children's hospice in the U.S. The U.K. has like 30, right? The U.K. is like the size of the Midwest, right? Uh, at, the, at the most, mm -hmm. right? They got 30 children's hospice. We have like Crescent Cove is the third in the U.S. And so that's a really important thing. Um, and and I'll, I'll probably just wrap this topic up with, um, as I grew up, I thought cancer was something that happened to somebody else. Yeah. Maybe it was a friend of a friend that had a child of cancer, and then it happened to me. Um, and it really changed my life. Um, it made me really appreciate 
children, uh, increased, uh, increased a level of empathy I have towards um, things that happen to others mm -hmm. a lot more. Uh, and it's something that we want to continue to help educate and make awareness around. Uh, and the people that lose their child, it's, it's just terrible. And um, we still, we're still in pain. We're still in pain. Uh, but we, but we love talking about Mary every day and the foundation is a way for us to keep that, those memories alive too. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a, people who haven't been through a, a, a terrible, terrible loss, yeah. they don't always know how to talk about it or ask about it. But I do, I do agree with you where when you do have lost something like that, you do want to talk about it because if you don't, like you said, it doesn't feel like you're keeping their memory alive, their legacy alive, their stories stories alive, and and how important they still are in your life, even though they're not with us. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've been told, oh, don't talk about her. And I'm like, so I get to hear about all your kids' activities, but I can't talk about my charity and what we're yeah. doing for her. And I'm like, that's my way of keeping her alive. That's me being a mother here until I see her again. Someday. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but, but it is kind of sad how you are not supposed to talk about it because it makes the other person uncomfortable and and some of the people that don't know, don't know the impact it has on parents i remember coming back to work and one of the people i work with never had kids goes you know what you're going through i just lost my cat and i just looked at her like really i wasn't mad i was kind of sad that she thought cat passing was the same as losing a child. I'm sure you've heard it all. People will say the strangest things that they think is comforting yeah. and yeah. I'll, I'll go talk about it. That's what we, we encourage. And yeah. You know, as I was as I was listening, you know, uh, Kelly, one more way people can help is a lot of people work for organizations that the work the company themselves provides funding on a on a match. Um, you know, where mm -hmm. if an if an employee gives fifty dollars, the customer, the, the, their their employer may also do a, a full or partial match of that and give to the foundation. So, mm. you know, we, we do have we do have I get checks um, every month in the mail, just a regular cadence from these other these other giving programs where employees have set up Mary Moon Foundation in their company giving portal to be able to, you know, donate to us. And so there are a lot of little ways that people and, and the, those those checks that, you know, uh, $50, I mean, we have costs, you know, to host the website, we have a storage unit for all of our supplies. So we have monthly expenses and all those things help offset those because those operational expenses are always exist. We, we manage them down um, so we can give as much to our, 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 our benefactors as we want. We can. Mm -hmm. So kind of circling back to the beginning, I just kind of want to talk about neuroblastoma. You know, yeah. I, I want people to know, like, what is neuroblastoma? How does it affect kids? And what are the common signs and symptoms? Well, um, at the time that Mary um, got diagnosed there in um, America, there was 550 cases a year. And in Minnesota, there was only 10. So it's a very aggressive cancer that's on, in the endocrine, and it usually will start on the adrenal gland. And it, and unlike other cancers that grow and then metastasize, this one metastasized. So I'll say, think of blast. It blasts out right away. So a lot of times by the time you catch it, it's already stage four. And they don't understand why, but if it's before 13 months of age, the survival the survivor rate at that time was 95%. And Mary's was at 30 to 40%. And so she was older. When yeah. They... And then I found out from another nurse that worked at Mayo that all of us, obviously we all have cancer in us, but the neuroblastoma is in there, but our immune system keeps it at bay. So what went wrong with her immune system that it just went, you know, and again, they said it, it has nothing to do with her diaphragmic hernia. So the signs typically that you'll see um, weight loss, constipation, because the tumor grows and it impedes with the um, digestive the, system. I almost said GI tract. I'm not. She's a nurse. I'm here to convert into layman's terms. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, the endoscopy nurse. I work with a gastroenterologist and colorectal. <laughs> 
So, and we, we're combo labor and delivery. Now. Thank you. So, um, the other thing that I mentioned earlier, the raccoon sign, where you get the black circles, they, um, since it goes to the bones, they get very anemic. And so they need blood transfusions. And yeah, so the typical signs at, and Katie, no, Katie, sorry, that was a, was a slip because I named Katie it's middle name after my daughter. Katie's early daughter. Yeah, her name's Katie. I'm Catherine Mary. So um, it goes to the bones. So it just mets right out and it went to her liver. It just goes everywhere. And so, and for me, um, she was sick a lot. <laughs> okay, so. There's so, the lame method. Okay, so, yeah, so what yeah. happened, we, we were on antibiotics and something got better. And then two weeks later, we're on antibiotics again. And that was the that was the thing was like Mary just keeps getting sick. We thought it was the the, the daycare, right? Again, because Christine called it a petri dish, which yeah. is another medical term from places where a lot of germs spread. So, um, <laughs> yeah. And, and so what happened is is that uh, it was just like she was sick all the time. And I really that was the, for for somebody in my shoes. If I could go back to that and say that's this is just not normal getting sick this often. Can we look a little deeper? To what the root cause may be and again it's such a rare cancer that you're not gonna most people well let me backtrack not backtrack but one of the doctors told me the oncologist um he said most pediatricians will never see neuroblastoma in their career it's that rare and so but the um treatments now have advanced so while mary was sick they were doing there's a lot of trials that they do and studies and i put mary in there i'm like well was she on like research meds okay because that's the only way to advance it so i'm like yep do it we'll do anything to save our daughter and and if it helps mary we could save other people but one of them was this new (laughs) immunotherapy and antibiotherapy and they Usually it's over many years. Well, they cut it short because it was it was a game changer, and now it it went from thirty to forty percent survival rate to about fifty percent to fifty five, and that, so it was a game changer. And Mary was one week out from starting that, and her cancer came back. So when the cancer came back, the cancer gets smarter, and so whatever we threw at it, it just kept growing. It it just escalated so fast what we watched within a three-week period mary just went downhill yeah so they made such advances so because it's such an aggressive cancer they have to do multiple not just chemo they did radiation they have to do the um, bone marrow um so that's that chemo on steroids because it's so aggressive you got to put everything at it um when Mary first got diagnosed, they couldn't remove her tumor because it was too big. They had to shrink it. And when they were done with the surgery, the, um, the surgeon said, yeah, I couldn't get out of it because it was wrapped around everything because it just mm. just starts going to other tissue. That's remember that metastasis. But they they, yeah. they, they, they put they almost killed the tumor. Right. But yeah. the problem is, is that you, know, a few cells you, go, you go through the, the heavy dose of chemo. Um, you hope you get it all, but if you don't get a hundred percent of it, it finds its way back and it knows how to overcome now the chemotherapy. So you have to do something different and that wasn't available to us at the time. Yeah. And so then, um, so then after the bone marrow transplant, they said, oh my gosh, she could go on this study. And so we were all excited that she could, you know, start on the antibody and then it came back and you have to have 50% or less of cancer in your body and Mary didn't qualify for that, so mm-hmm. she couldn't do that. So then we tried to raise money for Mary to go out to Sloan Ketterling. We were trying everything to save her, but we didn't know. Um, five days after our big fundraiser, one of our um, neighbors had um, collaborated with other neighbors and did a big garage sale. So everybody brought Aww. their stuff, and they raised a ton of money so we could go out there. And obviously we did. So it was, and so one of the kids that had neuroblastoma at the same time Mary did, they gave that same person a month to live. That person's still living. Well, that's he, great. They go out to Sloan Ketterlane and get the treatment that he needed. But the sad part is the side effects from the chemo 
in the radiation, Mary lost half her hearing. She couldn't hear anymore, and it affects the heart. It affects many organs. Because think of it, yeah. You're, yeah, you're 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 trying to kill something, and it goes after rapidly dividing cells. So that's why they need blood transfusions, platelets, and we always knew when Mary's platelets were low because she was getting a nosebleed. I'm like, oh, it's less than ten thousand, and the range for platelets is it's a wide range. It's one hundred and fifty to four hundred and fifty thousand. What's a what's a platelet? Platelet helps you with clotting. Oh, okay. So, I know, I know that. <laughs> Peter's here. Peter's here for all the non-medical people to make sure they're not missing anything. <laughs> the dirty nurse goes, "Mama." Yeah. Metastasize means spread, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, spread, yeah. Right? So now, yeah, I the statistics have changed and it's improving, and just like with all cancers you just see this improvement but there's not a lot of funding with um just childhood cancer research and but it's it's moving in the right direction and you're seeing more people that are survivors i'm envious of them but i'm happy because they got to live in progression right at least things are going in a progressive direction mm -hmm. you just wish yeah. that could have been the case for you for sure thank you yeah but okay. Was, she even the day she died, she goes, "Um, don't cry. Everything's gonna be okay." And she has to go to heaven. Yeah. So. Yeah. She's comforting her mother. It's not just weird. I'm not weird, but she was stronger than me. Is what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, mm -hmm. I, I I haven't died, but I feel like when people get to that a certain point, it seems like people who have experienced that being around those people something is happening where they feel like it is okay and it's fine and it's time to go. Mm -hmm. Well, she kept like reaching and talking yeah. in the room. So I know she, she's up there. Yeah. Um, so diagnosis for neuroblastoma, is that imaging? Um, first, of course, they had to do the biopsies and they went some lymph nodes and confirmed it there. And then they do, um, I think it's MIBG imaging. So what it, um, so there's different things that like it goes out of your kidneys and there's some, I'm trying to remember going back many years here, there's something with neuroblastoma that emits that they'll see through the kidney functions. And then the imaging is this contrast where if there's cancer, it picks it up and you see it everywhere. And I remember when we first looked at it, she lit up like a Christmas tree because mm. the cancer was everywhere. Everywhere. Oh, so, yeah. So there's um, obviously lab tests. There's um, um, different imaging and and then the, obviously the signs and symptoms. But the, the the final way that they knew is they did that biopsy and it came back. And sure enough, it was neuroblastoma. Any advice that you would give to a parent or a caregiver who is re recently learning how to navigate a neuroblastoma diagnosis for their child? I'll say number one, stay away from Google because they always put the worst case scenario on there. Stay away from, oh, Google. Yeah. At first I was like, what did Don't she say? Don't interrupt <laughs> for advice because they always just tell you the worst outcomes, right? You know, there it doesn't need to be the worst outcome. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, I'll say that because they'll come in and the trust is not there. But that one is just generalized on when you like Google anything, your doctor knows you because there's different types of neuroblastoma. Um, there's one that's called mech amplified, which is the most aggressive. And there's some that maybe haven't gotten to that point of being turning cancerous. So you can't look at that. And it, it depends on your age, what stage is it? And your doctor will know more than going to Google and I was questioning them. Yeah, you need to question things that don't seem right and you can get a second opinion if you don't feel right on something. But I think Google does more harm than good because they just, they're like, well, Google says this. I'm like, but Google doesn't know the exact thing that's going on with your, your child. And you can't do this alone. Get help. We couldn't have done it without our friends and family. They would come over, um, the labor and delivery um, girls would come to my house. They're like, we know you're not going to ask for help. So they just came to my house and just do it. Help. 
But, but if you do have to look things up on the internet, use Bing. Not Google. He works for Microsoft. <laughs> He's a nerd. And oh, so, yeah, I love it. it would, and and uh, there's obviously many apps that you can sign up and do meals and bring that to people. I had friends that would come down to um, to Masonic for 30 minutes to an hour so I could go for a run just to get out of there. Because certain people will eat. I went for runs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So what else would you add to that? I'm good. I think those are good. Yeah, very comprehensive. You think you covered it. Okay. Uh, anything else you guys want to share today? You probably want to talk about the day of the event, or what, what no, I, I think I think we covered off the event March sixteenth, uh, March sixteenth uh, coming up. Uh, we hope to, you know, anybody who wants to, my email is on the website. You know, reach out if you want to help, donate, contribute, you know, in any way. But of course, buy tickets. You know, um, they're discounted, uh, and I mean, you're it's cheaper than normal ticket for the whole day. And you get two hours exclusive access. That would be my final pitch. And we're going to have some fun things in the Parkview Conference Center there. Next, It's right next to Fly Over America if people look that up on the map. And if you Google shoot for the moon or what is it called? Bin? If you've been <laughs> shoot, shoot for the moon, then you'll be able to find it on there. And, 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 and like Peter said, too, so easy. If you do see it on there, share it on your Facebook page because word of mouth is everything. And, and it's free. It's free to hit share. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast and talking about this. Um, it's a, it's a delicate topic, and and I just really want to get the awareness out there of I, I go back to people don't know what to do or say when they've never been in a terrible situation, and just kind of bringing awareness to that and knowing how to treat people. We're still people, and we still need all the things that we need. So, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Kelly. All right. I'll see you in a few weeks at Shoot for the Moon. All right. <laughs> All right. Hang on one second, okay? Okay. <laughs>